Hello, and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in KSP 1.0.2. Before we proceed with ETS-3, the third EDB shuttle mission, a new design feature requires testing, recoverable boosters. What you see here is an uncrewed test vehicle to verify the booster recovery system. The shuttle cargo bay only contains a probe core so the boosters have a higher thrust limit than would be used on a heavier launch. There will also be no need to light the upper two rapiers on this launch, so here we go, T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, engine ignition, 1, and liftoff. Ooh, a little bit too much thrust on those boosters, but uh, off we go. Looks like it's correcting properly. And once it gets its balance, it'll begin the roll program. Here we go, roll program. Roll program is looking good here as shuttle takes off for this recoverable booster test. Once lined up with its launch azimuth, it'll begin the pitch program here. And here we see the shuttle proceeding up to its testing altitude, if you will, where the boosters will separate once they are spent. And here they go. Booster separation. The shuttle will continue up to orbit and then return on an automated trajectory. So if all goes well with this test, the only expense will be the external tank and the fuel involved. Now the full benefit of this system would only be realized with assistance from Stage Recovery or FMRS. Uh, for now though, we will just see whether these boosters are in fact recoverable. You can see the drag chute keeping it at a low speed before its main parachutes deploy. Its main parachutes deploy just before it uh, tries to break the sound barrier. And so before it breaks the sound barrier, they deploy and the drag chute is cut. Okay, approaching main chute full deployment. And there we have it, a bit of a shutter, but uh, main chutes have fully deployed and the booster seems to be in an all right orientation. A little bit more nose up here as it's preparing for splashdown. Will it survive intact? Yes, the booster is intact. All nice in one piece there. And so the recoverable booster system is a success. We have word that the other booster also landed safely. And so uh, with this, we will proceed to ETS-3, which will make use of these new recoverable boosters. And uh, let's turn to that right away. And so here we go with ETS-3, the third shuttle mission. This one will carry crew node one to Hoffman Station. Uh, the crew on this mission is Neil Brett, who is the commander, Durfell, Murgas, and Haytrude. They look all excited to go, and here we go, T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Uh, still a little bit of a kick there. The crew node is 7 tons, and so you see Neil Brett not using the rapiers. Perhaps uh, he should have turned on the rapiers a little bit there in order to keep that thing stable but uh, here we go anyway it looks like he's got it and off it goes ETS-3 roll program should begin and once the roll has completed pitch program will be in here of course once again the booster engines have been toned down to suit the heavier payload in the shuttle bay and again the maximum payload for this shuttle is 25 tons Shuttle looking good, nominal trajectory, everything looks fine for booster separation at this point, around 15 kilometers in altitude. Booster set. Okay, didn't appear to be any damage. Oh wait, there is an Elevon missing on the right wing there. That should not cause any problems, the shuttle is good to go, no need to abort at this point. Uh, the shuttle can remain stable with one Elevon missing. And so the mission continues, ETS-3 is still go for orbit. Thanks to the fact that its boosters are liquid fueled and therefore can be shut down, and also thanks to the fact that it uses rapiers which can switch to jet mode, the normal abort option for this shuttle would be return to launch site, which would for the NASA shuttle be the most difficult option. In this case it would be pretty much the easiest option for this shuttle. 
Here we see Neil Brett uh, using the rapiers for the first time here to stabilize the shuttle. This is entirely nominal so far. But uh, Neil Brett should really be unlocking that top tank and the external tank there. And here we see that uh, failing to do that quickly enough resulted in a pitch down. Uh, easily corrected, of course, with the Werner thrusters. But uh, still, some visible annoyance from the flight director, Gene Kerman. Using the fuel in the external tank, the shuttle proceeded to raise its apoapsis up to the orbit of Hoffman Station, as you can see here. The plan called for a rendezvous after a single orbit, and that should be easily managed with that gap. Here, the engines are shut down on the orbiter, the main engines, the skippers and we will prepare for external tank release. First all of the rapiers will go online, the main engines will be shut down, and now the separation of the external tank, which has a fair bit of fuel left in it, but that's because of the lighter load in the shuttle itself. Okay, unlocking the shuttle's fuel now. Proceeding to apoapsis, the shuttle will make a burn for orbit that will ensure the rendezvous after one orbit. See here orientation using RCS as well as the Werner thrusters. Here's the OMS burn and you'll see the rendezvous slowly taking shape here. There we go closing the gap there. And separation less than one kilometer is nominal. And so the shell proceeds to open its cargo bay doors in order to radiate heat. And you can see the crew node there now with uh, smaller docking ports suited to the GBNs. For the most part, the crew looked cheerful in orbit, but then when it came time to do the in cockpit TV broadcast, uh, they seemed to be quite. Uh, Quite serious, um, somewhere between business-like and wooden, you might say, and that was true of the entire crew. Very, very solid, I suppose. But, yep, anyway, they proceeded on to their rendezvous with Hoffman Station without any troubles. The shuttle, of course, will remain at a standoff distance away from the station as it releases the crew node, which will proceed to use its RCS thrusters to bring itself into the station. Of course, it will be remote controlled from the shuttle. So here we go, the shuttle reorienting in order to optimize the release of the payload. Control from the payload. And awaiting release of the payload here. Everything seems to be settled. There we go, payload release. Standard bump into the back of the cargo bay. And then unlocking of the RCS tanks which have been locked to prevent the shuttle from using that RCS fuel. Okay, here we go. The the payload is maneuvering out of the cargo bay. And should soon proceed over to Hoffman Station. This will not be a quick process as we want to be careful. This is an expensive module we're adding to the station. In fact, uh, everything to do with the shuttle is, of course, quite expensive. So here we see approaching the station and lining up with the docking port for this node. There's not too much of a fuss with the Clampatron Senior docking ports. They easily magnetize to each other, very easy to line up. And here we see success in the docking, very firm looks like a very solid structure we've got there for our station and in daylight but let's move on to the next part of the mission which is of course returning the shuttle back home there was a little bit of debris there the stack separator and the EDB will look into using decouplers instead of stack separators in the hope of preventing such debris but uh, studies will have to be done concerning whether that's safe to release a uh, payload using a decoupler inside the cargo bay decouplers of course are somewhat more explosive but um, 
Here we have a little bit of a problem because uh, Neil Brett accidentally kept his computer on target, in other words, focusing on Hoffman Station instead of on orbit, and therefore made an incorrect burn to uh, get to his descent orbit, which is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. But uh, here, Neil Brett corrected that. Unfortunately, that would not be the only mistake Neil Brett makes, but uh, here we go, uh, the descent orbit now, uh, 100 kilometers by 26.5 kilometers. That's further than what we saw in ETS-2, which was a 26 kilometer periapsis. And the hope is that uh, we can use some more of the drag from the shuttle, uh, keep a higher uh, ang pitch angle on descent. But it looks like this was uh, way too far. Uh, if you recall on ETS-2, the the impact point seemed to be on the west coast of the continent. Here, it's overshooting the KSC all the way. And of course, uh, that indicates that we will need to see the ETS shuttle turn around and uh, use its jets to maneuver back to the runway. And th that was pretty much the plan, though. Neil Brad tried his best using brakes. And uh, right now, the shuttle can't pitch up. It doesn't have that kind of control. It only has that kind of control higher in the atmosphere. So Neil Brett had to make a turn towards the south, and then he'll make a sharp bank towards the north, turning around to the west to line up with the runway. Okay, and lighting the rapiers in jet mode, of course, air breathing. At around 11 kilometers. This shuttle certainly maneuvers best when it's slower than the speed of sound, and so that's why we see here Neil Brett starting his maneuvers at a lower speed. You can see how high above the runway he was passing there. Not too far off, not as bad as ETS-1. This was, of course, an early evening landing, and that caused some visibility problems, but having to turn around like this meant that Neil Brett would have uh, better lighting on the runway, and so uh, this was actually beneficial. Nice smooth turn from Neil Brett here, uh, though uh, he doesn't seem to know what he's doing if we take a look at his image there. Not entirely clear that he has complete control over the situation, though the, the turn certainly looked like he had control. And here on approach, uh, Neil Brett had the flight director, Gene Kerman, tearing his, uh, well, tearing whatever hair out he has left. Um, Gear down, but a very, very much askew, further south than New Brett should have been, not quite lined up with the run runway at all. Applying brakes, but uh, lots of turning on, on this approach, and of course you never want to see that. That's not the best kind of approach here, but uh, that is the approach Neil Brett took. Even getting below two kilometers, he didn't seem to have a clear idea where the runway was because we see a lot of maneuvering from him. And uh, still with uh, jets producing some thrust when really they, they don't need to be. Right around here, Gene Kerman looked like he was about to have an aneurysm at mission control. And so it is likely that Neil Brett will not be allowed to command the next shuttle mission, or even the subsequent mission with this particular crew, uh, perhaps his uh, pilot, Hatrude, uh, who is not actually in control of the shuttle even though uh, she has the title pilot, uh, perhaps she will get a shot. Anyway, here we see the very shaky approach to the runway, still a little bit left. Of course, the shuttle was built to withstand quite a bad landing, and so uh, we'll see here its its resiliency despite New Brett's best attempts to uh, to at the very least collapse its landing gear. Ouch! Okay, a bit of a shake there. Not as not as bad as uh, as it could have been, but certainly not the approach anybody at Mission Control wanted to see. So, uh, waiting for wheel stop. Did not overrun the runway, at least. Uh, that is the one plus here. 
And so there it is, ETS-3, a successful mission, despite some shoddy piloting near the end. And we'll look forward to other such missions in the new future. But we still have one more piece of business to take care of. Jeb Kerbin has been waiting in orbit for quite a while now in his GBN. And now it is time for him to dock with Hoffman Station. So let's turn to that. So here we go with Jeb Kerman, and perhaps reinforcing the sense that this was not the best day for the EDB in terms of piloting skills, uh, Jeb remained controlling from his docking port at this point, and so when it came time for him to uh, get his orbit up to that of the stations, uh, he ended up uh, creating quite a skewed orbit, and we'll see that here in a sec. Uh, he at first tried to lift his orbit using mod propellant, but of course because he's pointing at completely the wrong vector, uh, that didn't seem to be working, so he just used main power using his rapier engine. And uh, you'll see that uh, he is ignoring the fact that his periapsis is going down into the atmosphere. He could no longer ignore this fact, of course, as he actually started hitting the atmosphere, uh, but he used main power, he used the rapier engine in order to boost his apoapsis and keep himself in line and of course he finally switched to control from the cockpit just not not a good day for the EDB and in fact uh, at, after that little uh, fiasco uh, concluded Gene Kerman decided to call a day and called in the backup uh, mission control crew and so the backup was in as uh, as Jeb Kerman approached Hoffman station here just to be clear, the backup crew is completely competent and briefed, and so it wasn't any sort of dereliction of duty on Gene Kerman's part. In fact, it was probably safer that he he decided to bring in the backup crew after after the long day. Uh, so uh, here, Jeb lining up with the station. Very critical that he gets his orientation proper. Otherwise, uh, quite a, quite a few parts on his own little GBN would collide with parts of the station and so the the orientation has to be just right as you'll see once we get closer to the station. It's likely that on two of the Clampatron docking ports, the 1.25 meter docking ports, uh, some extensions will need to be placed in order to allow for a full docking of four GBNs on that node and we'll see that in a sec as well. Okay here's the approach to the docking port. You can see the very careful maneuvering that is necessary and they are lined up. The large Clampatron Senior at the end of uh, Crew Node 1 uh, probably will not be able to fit a 2.5 meter module there. I'm sure there's already a very clear idea about what is going on with that particular docking port. Anyway, but we can see the tight fit that Jeb has to manage here. And there he goes. He is docked. And uh, if we take a look at the nose, there is clearance on that side for a module, so that Clampatron Senior docking port is not obstructed. And uh, so you can see the nice fit there. And again, uh, probably extensions on the on the docking ports that are currently perpendicular to the one that Jeb is at, if we want to attach GBNs in there. So Jeb transferred into the station and took command of Hoffman Station. And uh, so everything is underway as planned, and we will look forward to further missions with the EDB. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and we'll see you next time.